That's the question. Jesus Christ, who are you? Who is Jesus? Is he just a revolutionary hero? Or is he something more? Before time began, he existed. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Well, good morning, TC. I am thrilled that you guys are here with us uh, in this room, but I'd also like to welcome in those of you at each of our campuses and those of you watching online today. Uh, we are continuing in the second week of our brand new series called I Am. Uh, as many as you can tell, I am not Alex. My name is Clint, and I am the next generation pastor here at TC. And uh, to know what I do, I have the awesome, incredible job of working with what I believe is the most incredible next gen staff at every one of our campuses. I I'm telling you, I know this to be true. Uh, that we have the very best staff working with our preschoolers, uh, with our elementary students, with our junior high, with our high school, and even our special needs students. Uh, for me, uh, of, of 15 years of doing this, it is absolutely mind-blowing to walk and to serve with some of the most incredible staff because of the way they love Jesus, the way they walk beside your family. I know that many of you uh, at all of our campuses, at Jinx, at uh, South Tulsa, Midtown, Downtown, Owasso, even here at Battle Creek, you see the way this team equips volunteers and puts Jesus in front of these kids. And it's just awesome for me to get to be here today. I, I wanna start off by thanking Pastor Alex for just giving me the opportunity to take on week two, but I, I need to go ahead and bring everybody in on this thing. I, I believe what we are covering today could possibly be one of the most impactful things that you hear, because I believe that it is a word straight from the throne of heaven to you today. I wanna encourage you to really dial into God's word and hear what God is speaking to each of us. Last week, Alex opened up this series really looking at uh, the, the, the moment where Moses got, uh, uh, got to the burning bush and God revealed himself in a powerful way. It was the idea where God took Moses, a man full of questions about his own identity. This was a guy who struggled with having no peers at his age because they were sought out and killed. He was uh, one of the first mentions of adoption in scripture where he was given up by his mom and taken into Pharaoh's house. He, he struggled with who he was growing up in a different house with a different language, with a different people. And as he grew and struggled, he made mistakes and choices and then ended up running away completely. And this man came with all of his flaws, all of his insecurities to a moment where God said, I want to do something to, uh, with you. He came to a point that God was drawing him in. And, and here's the, the amazing thing about God. God saw a purpose for Moses' life. God saw through and uh, uh, beyond his past, his insecurities, the things that he didn't bring to the table. And he declared to Moses over and over again, I want to use you. And church, let me just say this up front. I believe that God has that same message for each one of us today. God wants to do something with your life. Well, pastor spent time really unpacking this entire interaction in Exodus chapter three. And, and what I love about it is Moses kind of fumbled through this whole idea. He kept laying out every reason why God shouldn't use him. He, he went through his feelings of not being ready, not qualified or even worthy to be used. But God continued to say, I have a purpose that's greater than your insufficiency. Now, the interesting thing is, is, is that we, we have that same flaw. We come to church this morning, we're watching online, we're, we're at one of our campuses and we're going, man, I, I, I don't think this is for me. And we discount ourselves and we ourselves come in with our baggage, with our past. And you go, Clint, if you only knew who I was or what I've done, you, you wouldn't even realize the car ride this morning. I mean, I'm unequipped, I'm insufficient. And, and listen, I'm not Moses. Do you understand? He's Moses. A lot of this book is written about his life. I'll never be that guy. But Moses brought that same insecurity. And when his excuses ran out and he laid everything before God and God said, I still want to do something. He, he went and he said, you know what? 
I'm going to answer you this one question when he said, who would I say sent me? And Moses hears God answer with his identity. He answers with his name, Yahweh, or I am. That's strange, don't you think? When we come to God and he says, I want to use you, and you say, God, I can't. I'm not ready. I don't know enough. Surely there's someone better than me. And God answers with his own identity, I am. God took in that moment, that man, maybe he's taking this moment today with you, and he's pulling the focus off of Moses, off of us, and he puts it on himself. And what I love about Scripture, what I love about the Bible, is when you walk through the Old Testament from Exodus chapter 3 and then you get to the Gospels, you see Jesus, the Son of God, the Holy One of God, come down and he begins to mirror the same language that God used with Moses. In the Gospel of John, we see seven times him say, I am dot, dot, dot. He uses that same I am that God gave to Moses to those listening to him. And last week, Pastor Alex took one of those statements, I am the bread of life. And, and Pastor began to peel off the layers of what bread is. And, and we talked about bread, right? Like that there is something that changes a meal with good, hot bread, right? It just makes everything better. You put the, the, the honey, the jam, the butter, whatever it is, that bread is something that you desire. And in those days, it was a staple. And he made three points and he says, you need to understand that the bread of life, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, that was an offer of salvation, because bread saves us. The bread of life saves our souls. He also went on and said, the bread of life sustains us. It helps us make it through. And then it satisfies us. And I remember last week, one of my favorite things that we do as a church happens. At every campus, we got together and we celebrated communion. We took the Lord's Supper, right? We took that juice and we took the bread. And in that moment, we began to remember everything that Jesus did for us his sacrifice, his love. That moment is brought to our mind when we went from death to life. No simple thing, right? That it reminds us of his love and sacrifice when we take the Lord's Supper. So to say that I am excited about what we're going to cover today is an understatement, y'all. If I get to sweat and it's okay, I'm just excited because I believe God wants to do something in our church. I believe God wants to do something in our city and in our world. And in John, there are seven times where Jesus says, I am. The one we're going to look at today is found in John chapter 15. So if you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to John chapter 15 so you can walk along with us where Jesus states, I am the true vine. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Now, as I begin to study this, this was a little hard for me, all right? I'm thinking about the vine and, 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 and that stuff. I, I grew up in the city. I had no reason at all to ever grow anything other than weeds in our backyard. I, I, didn't, I didn't have anything to, to go. We would kill the flowers or the trees or whatever. When I think about growing stuff, I have an uncanny ability to murder any plant. It doesn't matter if it's big, small, water resistant, a cactus, it's going to die under my care. And so I started thinking about this. Well, what is he trying to say? And the whole passage really became about the idea to convey to those that were listening is that he is the true vine. And this passage creates a strong understanding of you must be connected to Jesus. It's vital. It's important. And I think in my world, if, if it's not a vine, what are some of the things that need to be connected? I, I think, first of all, to Wi-Fi. Anywhere you go, you're trying to connect to the Wi-Fi. And you, you see the sign when you walk in and it says free Wi-Fi. And you're like, yes, they don't password and protect, right? Like you can get on the Wi-Fi. You can keep knowing what's going on. Or maybe you want to connect to social media. You want to find out where uh, people are going for spring break or where they're going for vacation or how the family is or what's going on. You want to see and be a part of people's life being connected to their social media. Or maybe you go a little old school and you just want to connect with people. It doesn't matter where you are, if you're at school or if you're at work or you're in the neighborhood, you just want to connect, right? Everybody wants to be a part of something. 
I was reading an article the other day uh, about Oklahoma's second Heisman Trophy winner in a row, Kyler Murray. Now, if you don't know this, I went to Texas A&M. We were the ones that recruited him, told him he was too short to play for us, and then he transferred to Oklahoma, went to the college playoffs, won a Heisman, and is now going to be the number one person in the draft. He wasn't good enough for us, all right? So I'm reading it through this lens of failure, right? Uh, but, but it's great because many of the things that happened in his life were due to incredible connections, all right? His, his uncle was an amazing major league baseball player. Just growing up seeing that, the work ethic, that it took. And his dad, quite possibly, arguably, the, the best quarterback that Texas A&M ever had. I, I, he was incredible. And when he was finished with his college career, he began to coach in Dallas. And, and you just got to understand that from the time that Kyler was very little, he was around and connected to the people that saw skill in him that saw promise in him and they would train him and they would encourage him and get him connected to the right people. And through the years as he progressed in his skill and his connections and goes 42-0 and in high school, three state titles, and then goes on to a minor setback at Texas A&M and then on to Oklahoma, and then he wins a Heisman Trophy and now may have his name called as the number one overall football draft pick. It's just incredible. But it came back to a lot of not only just his skill, but his connections to the right people, the right place, and all those things. And you may say this morning, Clint, look, I'm no Kyler Murray, just like I'm no Moses. Like, what are you getting at at this connection deal? Well, let's, let's drop it back down to a Clint example, right? One of the ways that, that I try to connect constantly is, is in my car, right? I, I, I'm kind of mobile in what I do, so I'm always looking to connect and do my work in the car. I do my phone calls. I, I do all my connections there. But one of the things that is so frustrating is when you're driving somewhere, you hear the phone ring, you want to keep both hands on the wheel, and you answer the phone and you say hello and no one is there. And you say hello again and you hear a, fall, uh, a small faint voice from the bottom of your cup holder saying hello, hello. But you're not connected to the Bluetooth in your car, right? And so you're trying to get connected. You're trying to hear before they hang up and get weirded out because they sound like they're in a whale. Uh, you, you just are looking for that connection. And it is so frustrating when we're not connected. Now, church, this is a setup because if we're honest, this is the way we need to look at our spiritual lives each and every day. Are we connected in a real and powerful way to Jesus, our Savior? So today we're going to be talking about connecting to the true vine and how that prepares us and equips us for what God wants to do in and through you. I want to circle back to something that pastors begin to say from stage over and over as he explains who we are as a church, who we are as TC. He says, listen, we have to be about four things. And these are the four things that are going to define us, that are going to make people know who we are. And the first one is this, we are going to be a people that help people know about God. That we're going to be a church that helps people know about God. But secondly, we're going to help people find freedom that most of us are bound up, wrapped up, trapped and entangled in so many things. And here's a place that you can come. It's the perfect place for imperfect people. And you will begin to find freedom. The third is is like it. We're going to help people discover their purpose. There's nothing more dangerous than somebody who's got purpose, right? They begin to drive. They begin to push. They know nothing can stop them. But lastly, that we're going to be a people. We're going to be a church that makes a global impact. And I believe that in this moment, doesn't matter where you've come from, what you've brought in with you, what your ride to church, what your last week, no matter what your bank account says, no matter what your social media says, no matter who says you are, you've come to this place and this moment. And I believe that God's word wants to speak right to you this morning. Do you, my friend, let me tell you this. You are important to God and you are a part of his plan to draw the world to himself. So today, in this moment, I want to invite you to take a journey with me as we look at 11 verses together and see what God says about his purpose and will, but also what Jesus says about who he is, and then in turn, what that does for us, how it impacts us and empowers us to potentially change our sphere of influence, whether that's at home, at school, at work, anywhere that you go. 
that God can begin to direct your life out of this moment. So let's go together to John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. We're going to go through it, and then we're going to start to tear that apart and ask God to speak to us in a very real way. John 15, verse 1 says this. I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. Now, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do not bear fruit, so they will produce even more. Now, you've already been pruned and purified by the message that I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot bear fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered together into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be given to you. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. Now, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Now, church, this may be a very familiar passage to you. Some of you, it may be the first time you've ever heard it. But I want to show you that there is such power packed in these verses with great information that leads us to to this journey where we grasp greater who Jesus is and how that intersects with our lives starting today. You need to understand this, that God desires to use us and that we bring him glory. And ultimately, our joy is made complete by being connected to the vine. Now you've heard our pastor say this several times, that we must give God all the glory and he in turn gives us all the joy. Now that comes from the idea of knowing this, God has moved incredibly the last year in TC, has he not? We have seen so many people move from death to life. We have seen salvation after salvation after salvation. We have celebrated baptism after baptism after baptism. We have seen marriages put back together. We have seen families created. We have seen adoption and and all of these things become a part of what we do. And God is moving. And we would never say it was us. We always say, God, thank you for letting us be a part. And when we give him the glory, he then gives us the joy. And we can't ever get it backwards. Because when we start grabbing at that glory, We get that moment where where we take in the glory and then we're robbed of the joy because we know everything flows through him. So this morning, I'm going to give us three things as we kind of peel apart some layers of John chapter 15 this morning that I want you to write down. I want to encourage you to take notes that that you write this down, that you go back to, to, to look and to study because wouldn't you, if you know that God from the throne of heaven was speaking a word over you, Wouldn't you want to know it inside and out? Wouldn't you want to hear what he has to say? So let's go back and see. The first thing I want you to write down is this. Connection to the true vine provides life. Connection to the true vine provides life. Now listen to this church. Jesus gets very specific on who he is and how we're to stay connected to him. In John 15, verse 4, he says this, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Now, he's telling us how this relationship must work. Not should work or could work. He's telling us how it must work. Uh, That word remain at the beginning where he says remain in me, that word remain, some of you have translations that say abide or stay, right? It's all the same Greek word. That Greek word is meno, M-E-N-O, meno, all right, which means this, there is a profound, 
There is an intimate, there is an enduring relationship that that remain is so closely connected. And in the Greek, it's not a suggestion. It's actually a command, an imperative in the original language. The Son of God is commanding the believer to abide, commanding the believer to remain, commanding the believer to stay and to endure with a profound connection. Because apart from him, you can do nothing. Jesus is the source of life. Jesus is the source of power. He's the one who bridges the gap between me and you and the Father. Now get this. He is exclusively the power source. When he says, I am the true vine. Now there's this verse in Acts chapter 17, verse 28. It's so great. It it almost does a physical reaction when I think about it. And he says this, for in him we live and move and exist In him we live and move and exist. Connection to the true vine provides life. Jesus is the one and only way to the Father, and he invites you to come. Now, there's just something right about being connected to Jesus. I mean, being connected to Jesus, there's just something powerful about it. I I think about this as it rolls into uh, my role as a dad. I have two kids. I have a boy and a girl. And I have to think about this. There are different ways to connect to both of them. I, I mean, I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but raising a girl and raising a boy are totally different things. Can I get an amen anywhere? I'm telling you, it has been one of the most challenging things in my life to see how different they are. My daughter just turned 10, and so for me, I'm having this crazy revelation that I have had her in my home longer than I will have her before she moves out and goes to college. And so in my mind, I've started taking these moments going, how can I capture the moments that I have? How do I take advantage of what is already there? And so one of the things that I've done with my daughter that I never thought I would do, but, but I'm actually kind of excited about is I learned how to do her hair. And I got to be honest, I'm not half bad, all right? <laughs> I mean, I wanted to be one of those dads who could brush her hair, that could braid, that could do all the different things because I knew in those few moments I could talk with her. Now, my daughter was super patient with me, all right, as I tugged on that brush and snapped her head back, as I got caught in, you know, the curls and things like that, and and she let me send her to school with this amazingly jacked up hairdo over and over again. I I mean, her hair is beautiful. It's it's golden blonde and curly, and it just flows, And, and I tell you, it's one of the most beautiful sights in the world. My daughter's hair is gorgeous. It, it, it flows me, uh, blows me away because mine is running away from my face, all right? But I, but I look at her hair and I think how pretty it is. It's impressive until I head to her sink. And then I look at her sink and there is dirt from I don't know where. There are smudges and daubs of toothpaste And all of a sudden you realize that that smell that's coming from the bathroom is a clogged sink that the water doesn't run through. So as I go up there, I get my tool and I begin to to fish down through there and I pull out this. It's awful. It's tangled. It's it's dripping. It's gross. It smells. And, And isn't this the hair we were just talking about that is so beautiful? But somehow it's now changed and it is no longer beautiful. And the reason that this is now so awful is because it's disconnected. When it's no longer connected, this is no longer right. I mean, you don't want to see hair on the floor in the corner of the the house, right? You don't want to go out and have it around your neck and it's somebody else's hair. You definitely don't want it at the restaurant when it comes out and it's on your food, right? I mean, hair is supposed to be connected to someone's head and that's easier said than done for some of us. But hair is supposed to be connected. That's what makes hair beautiful is being connected. And when we're connected, we're living our design. 
Disconnection makes no sense for us, which brings us to our second point, where we understand that connection to the true vine provides life, but it also says that connection to the true vine produces fruit. And when Jesus says here, he says a repeat of I am, the same words that God used with Moses. We're hearing here today in verse 5 and 6. Look back to the text. He says, yes, I am the vine. And you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and wither. Such branches are gathered into a pile and are burned. He says we're going to produce much fruit. Now, did anybody pick up on that progression? In verse 2, he says that our design is to produce fruit. And then he goes on at the end of verse 2 and says that we're to bear more fruit. And then here in verse 5, he says that our capacity, our design is to bear much fruit. The fruit is growing. I mean, we're connected to the Holy Son of God. He is the vine. We're the branches. We bear the fruit. It is supposed to be we're bearing fruit, more fruit, and then much fruit. Listen to me, Christian. You're not supposed to have a weak and fruitless life. We are to bear fruit that comes from our connection to Jesus. But do you see this piece of doctrine underlined here? Jesus is not producing the fruit. The branches are. He is the source and the power to the branches. Now, God has chosen to bring fruit about through you and through me, the branches. Isn't it amazing to think that God chooses to work through us to impact the world? Just like Moses, he came going, God, I can't do this. Man, I stutter, I'm messed up. You know my past. I can't do this full of flaws and insecurities. But when he was connected to the Father, a powerful leader of many was he. The same thing with us, that our lives connected to Jesus bring about impact. So you go, Clint, what is this fruit that we're supposed to produce fruit, more fruit, and much fruit? Well, we've got a a, a snippet to look at in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Here's how some of the fruit is uh, defined. He says this, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do those things describe your life when you're connected in? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In John 15, he, he says, apart from him, we can do nothing. Verses 7 and 8 in John 15 continue to say this, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything that you want and it will be granted you. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples, and this brings great glory to my Father. Now, I want to back up a a, a verse and handle what God shares about his words remaining in you. TC, the teachings, the teachings of Jesus, the whole Bible needs to remain in you. Because when you do, Jesus gives you permission to ask whatever you want, and it will be given to you. Now, now, let me just go ahead and set the record straight here. This is not a magic lamp verse, right? Like you do your quiet time and then all of a sudden God gives you a Lamborghini and forgives all of your debts and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's not how this works. This is not a, a cheap gospel, right? But there is a directive to let scripture pour over your life to shape you, to refine you, to lead you, to conform you to the image of Jesus and the will of God. John writes in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 through 15, and we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since we know he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. Church, when you sit under the counsel of God's word and daily, I mean every day, you're committed to reading God's word, 
to studying it, to go beyond and peeling off layers of it. You're memorizing, you're putting your mind, you're putting in your heart. You're applying God's word faithfully to every asset and every existing point of your life. Faithfully, it says you will be connected and conformed to his will. And this opens a door for you to pray his will. And then he answers. Church, this brings glory to God. Now, I, I did student ministry for about 14 years. And one of my chief roles was to encourage and train our adult volunteers. And one of the things that I constantly gave them as a tool was to, to pray for their students by name. And they'd go, well, I, I kind of pray for them as a group and, you know, that kind of deal. But I, I kept pressing on it. Because as I would reflect in my own life, I would know in my prayer life, there were times where I would get down on my knees and I would do business with God. Because Hebrews chapter four says that we're invited into his throne room and it's there that we find mercy and grace and help in our time of need. And I would get there and I began to pray for my wife. I began to pray for relationships for her. I would begin to pray for friendships and a love for God and for his word and for ministry and for favor. God, I would just pray over her and I'd lift her up and say, God, would you do something knowing that the things I'm praying for her, he was wanting to answer. And then I would take my daughter and I began to pray for her in years. I would just pray, God, save her. God, would you just let her come to know you, the one true God? And we saw him answer that prayer because 2 Peter 3 says, I wish that, all men, uh, that, none would come to, uh, that none would perish, but all come to repentance. And I would pray for her and I pray for her future spouse. I pray for that man that he would be set apart, that he would be holy, that he would be the man of God that God called him to be, to walk with her. And I pray for her relationships at school and favor and ministry. Then I'd get on my knees and I'd pray for my son. Lord, help this little joker. Do something. I don't even know what to pray. And then I would stand up from this prayer and I would go, who else prays for my family the way that I do? And a sobering reality came. Probably nobody else. And that our youth leaders, our next gen leaders, I would say there may be no one who has ever prayed for that kid by name. They may have prayed for him in general, but they've got no one running them to the throne of heaven, God saying, God, do a work. God, do something in this little life. Do something in this teenager. Break the bond of sin. Help them walk through this terrible thing that their family's going through. And going, it is so important that we pray. But our lives are conformed around the image of Christ and his word. And we say, God, when we pray these things, we know he answers. How powerful a tool is that for volunteers? Am I right? I'm going to get to preaching here in a second, all right? Because I believe that we've been sold this cheap thing to say, hey, you do what's right, God will give you what you want. Hey, when you set your life under submission of the cross, God begins to change you and he begins to move through you to produce much fruit. Which brings us to our third and final point. We know that connection to the true vine provides life. Connection to the true vine produ produces fruit. But thirdly, connection to the true vine promises joy. It promises joy. I don't know, but I bet there could be some people at one of our campuses or in this room here today that you could use some, some more joy. Am I right? I mean, true joy. If we're honest, life's been so tough recently, we don't even know what joy feels like anymore. So what do we do? We chase happiness. We chase anything that'll make us feel better, right? But I can promise you, church, the only place that true abiding joy is found is in the true vine of Jesus. Let's look at verses nine through 11. Jesus says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Whew. Jesus says, I've loved you the way the Father has loved me. That's intense. He goes on and says, remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love just as I obey my father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And that's the bottom line, isn't it? That our connection to Jesus, it definitely provides life. 
It most certainly produces fruit. But man, it provides a much needed joy. Now, I need to tell you something. This does not just give us the, the, the ability to walk forward and going, hey, everything's going to be good. Because you got to understand there's two sides to this coin. In John chapter 10, verse 10, we see something very clear. It says this, that the thief, the enemy of your soul, the one who wants to take you out, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. Anybody feel like that guy's been a neighbor to you recently? To steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Jesus ultimately provides you with abiding, remaining, staying, relational joy. Now listen, that does not mean everything in your life is going to go right. That doesn't even mean things are going to get easier. That is a cheap interpretation of this verse. Walking with Christ is not for the faint of heart. It is tough, hard, lonely, narrow road. But on that road, there is inexplicable joy that comes from knowing the Savior of my soul. Amen? The King of heaven, the God of the universe, there is life-changing joy in connection to him. Verse 10 says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love. Now, church, if we're honest, if we're honest, this is where we struggle. When the pressure and anxiety of this life just cuts us at the knees, we're quick to abandon the vine and go search for fulfillment elsewhere, are we not? Jesus says, remain, remember? Stay, abide. It's a command in my love. Remain in my words, obey my commands. John 14, 15 says this, if you love me, obey my commands. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. It's one of the most simple ideas, but something we constantly struggle with. Think about this. If Jesus is who he says he is, if Jesus is the high king of heaven, the perfect sacrifice, the lamb, the lion, he is who he says he is. Doesn't he deserve everything that we have? And when we obey, there's a switch that's flipped in our life that changes our perception on everything. First John 5, 2 through 3 says this. Now we know we love God's children if we love God, watch this, and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. You want to check your fruit this morning? Are the commandments and obedience to God burdensome in your life? I think at times it is. But taking that burden off comes from having a deeply rooted connection to Jesus as the vine. The temptations of this world, the lures of the enemy, the schemes of the devil, they're all trying to convince you that the things of God are wearisome that they're heavy, that they're burdensome, and you don't need them. Just live your life now. It's, it, it's going to be one of those things where just go get them. Worry about obedience later. But there is fruit when we obey. It shows the world that we're his. TC, can I just speak something over you right now? I believe that we're at a point as a church where God is calling us to something more. Something beyond normal, beyond average. Our God does not do average. We're, we're coming to the point of sweeping revival. And we can either be a part or not because we know God wants to move and draw all people to himself. I vote that we jump in. I say, God, do something wild. Do something that has to be written in the history books because your spirit fell in a powerful way. But understand, the vine has branches that produces fruit, and he works through us. So my question must be, to end our time together, how's your connection to the true vine? How is your connection to the true vine? Where are you today, really? Because I bet most of us would admit, just like Moses, we come into a, a, a service like today. 
knowing that we don't measure up, knowing that we desperately need a deeper connection to our Savior, to abide in the true vine. This is what you need to know. When Jesus answers and says, I am, church, it's enough because he is God and he wants to move. God invites us in close. And when we understand when he moves revival on our town, on our state, on our nation, on our world, when he does what only he can do, he gets the glory and we get the joy. We get to bear fruit to his glory. So what I want to do is I started out earlier. I said, what if God wants to bring you like Moses to a burning bush this morning? And he wants to talk to you. He has given you this moment to get alone with him, to look inside, to evaluate where we are today. So in this moment, I want to ask you just to do something very simple. I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads in this moment. And I want you to listen to the sound of my voice that asks this question. In all reality, has the true vine become your source of life? Because I want to tell you, there's a difference in knowing about God and knowing God. What we know about God is this, that he is perfect, holy, awesome, and powerful. And we are not. that in our rebellion, we have chosen against God. Thoughts that we've let become actions, anger and bitterness that we've harbored, we've stolen, we've lied, we've had all of these sins and uh, these sins. And what happens is there is a declaration that says all of these sins must be paid for. Hebrews chapter nine actually says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. For every choice that you've made against God, something must shed its blood and die. And understanding the weight and payment of our sin, God offered something new and different. His son, Jesus, the true vine. And Jesus came into this world, grew up, lived a perfect life, called many to the kingdom and then one day suffered and bled and died on a cross in your place. And as they took him from that cross and put him in a grave for three days dead and gone. But on that third day with all power and authority He broke loose from death and rose from the grave, victorious and powerful. And listen to me, for you today, there is an offer to come near, to lay your old identity down, to lay your past sin and indiscretion down, to lay your mistakes and inferiority and flaws at the foot of the cross. we would turn from our sin and turn in faith to him he will save us so if that's you this morning I want you just to pray something quietly in your heart like this God you are perfect and I am not I have sinned against you and payment is due for my sin I want to thank you that your son died in my place and shed his blood, his life for mine. And in the best way that I know how, I turn from my sin and I turn to you, God, and say, save me now. You died, you rose again. I want you in my life. The old gone, the new in you. Jesus, save me. what we know to be true and in that confession of faith and that belief in your heart that you have been made brand new. 
might I be the first to say welcome to the family of God. We want you to celebrate and tell somebody that they could walk you through steps of discipleship and obedience and baptism. We're so excited when God changes lives. But for the majority of you in the room here today, for those of you on our campuses and online, I have a different question for you. What's keeping you from bearing much fruit? Is there a habit that's got a stranglehold on your life? You fight and fight, but you're not strong enough to break away. Or maybe there's a hurt, there's a deep wound inside that's been inflicted and you need God's healing touch today. Or maybe there's some hang up that you have with religion or church or people. Maybe your finances are tight. You can barely breathe. The anxiety of the day and the week to come is overwhelming. And you just need God to come through. You want to abide in the vine because you look out at your branch and there's not much fruit. So with everybody's head still bowed and eyes still closed, I want you to do something for me. I want you to hold out your hands in front of you with your palms facing up like you're receiving a gift. Now I want you to take that habit or that hurt or that hang up that's causing you to not bear much fruit and I want you just to put a death grip on it in your hand. And in a moment, I'm going to give you a chance to talk to God and say, God, this is the thing that's not letting me bear much fruit. God, I've been holding on to this habit. I've been holding on to this hurt, to this hang up. And God, I know you've called me to walk in freedom and in power and in purpose. And I want to draw near to you. And as I pray over you, as you deal with that with God, I want you to open your hands and release it to him and say, God, this is now yours. It's under the blood of your son. And God, I pray for fruit in my life. So as you're holding on, and as I pray over you, I'm gonna ask that as you feel ready to lay that at the foot of the cross, that you would release it to him and that you would stand in worship. So let's pray together and ask God to move in a powerful way. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for a moment under the counsel of your word. God, we thank you for Jesus being the true vine that gives power and life to the branches. God, we pray for fruit in our lives that would impact a watching world, that you would heal brokenness, that you would give victory over entanglement. And God, today, we would trust you like we've never trusted you before. God, would you do a work in us? Would you do a work in our church? Would you do a work in our city, in our state, in our nation, in the world for the glory? We will give you all the glory and we will thank you for the joy. So Lord, we lift these things in our hands to you. In the name of Jesus. Speak to me. 
Father God, that's our prayer in this moment, is that we surrender, Father. We surrender to you, Lord. And Lord, I pray in this moment, Lord, that as we remain in you, Father God, that you would breathe in us, Father, and that you would have your way in and through us, Father God. Thank you so much for the life change that's taken place in this moment, Father God, for the words you've spoken to your people in this moment. Lord, we seal those things and we just say that would those things be seeds that go down deep, take roots and bear fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. Remember to click subscribe and turn on your notifications if you haven't already so that you don't miss a single thing. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Instagram and at our website, thechurch.at. Again, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.